Well, thank you so much. It's so wonderful to see all of you here. And thanks, Dorian, for that lovely introduction. And thanks for everything that the Minnesota Lyme Association does in terms of education and support and advocacy. So thanks, thanks for all you do. Um, so I am so glad that the only technical glitch that we have tonight is that instead of this being where all of my slides are being projected, it's over there, but at least it's being projected. Um, and it actually has the benefit of like, then you're not gonna be looking at me, so I'm not gonna be feeling quite so on the spot. So what I would suggest, and like I, everything that I have to say is there, you don't need to look at me. So what you might wanna do is turn your chairs around so you can see my cool slides that I spent a lot of time working on. So. So whoever said that money can't buy happiness did not have Lyme disease. It is an extremely expensive illness. It is um, very hard, I think, for people because most Lyme literate providers do not take insurance. A lot of the treatments are out of pocket. And on top of that, many people who have Lyme disease are just too sick to work. Um, so I thought it might be helpful to have a conversation about how you can get the most bang for your buck, how you can get the most for your money. And the ideas that I'm gonna share with you tonight are the distilled wisdom of Lyme providers, many of my patients, um, and for me the best part of the evening is gonna be at the end of my formal presentation when you guys are gonna give your ideas of how we can, um, how we can make this a cost-effective treatment. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna present some guiding principles to help make financial decisions about healthcare. And this is actually not just for Lyme disease, this can be for any kind of medical expense or medical issue. I'm gonna talk about some specific ways to save money in testing and treatment. And then, as I said, I wanna have time for your comments and questions and pushback. And that's why I passed around the little index cards because if you have a question or a comment um, or another idea, um, or you wanna say something about one of my ideas, then what you can do is write it on the card and Dorian is gonna wander around and, um, and pick them up and if you need a pen or another index card, you can ask her as well. So I think that there are four guiding principles for making a decision about Lyme care or actually any other kind of care. Um, and I'm gonna go through them and then we're gonna take each one at a time. And I recognize that many of you have Lyme brain. And so if you got a handout, pretty much everything that's on the slides is on the handout. So you don't even really need to take notes if you don't want. So the first guideline is accepting that you need to invest in your treatment. The second, evaluate each option carefully for its value. Third is use your Lyme literate provider as a resource. And the fourth is to negotiate to get the most cost effective care. So we're gonna uh, take one at a time. So the first one, accept that you need to invest in treatment. So you may say, wait a minute, I thought that this was a talk about how to save money, not how to spend money. It seems kind of counterintuitive to be talking about how you need to invest. Um, but let me ask you a question. How many of you tonight are barefoot? Let me raise your hand, anybody barefoot? Okay, so that's roughly 0% of you. And that's because if you choose to live in Minnesota in January, you have to invest in footwear. So I would submit that if you choose to get better from your Lyme disease, you really have to invest in your health. Lyme has kidnapped your health. You need to ransom it back and you're gonna have to invest in that. So you obviously have to invest financially and um, we talked about all those other things. Um, but you also have to invest in lifestyle. And some of you who are here who are my patients are probably thinking, oh, okay, here comes the table. So I tell people that your health is kind of like a table with four legs. And if any of the legs is missing or broken, the table is not gonna be stable. And so as much as it might seem like talking about your health is a little bit of a detour away from saving money. Actually, if your health is not stable, you can put whatever you want on the table, it's just gonna slide right off and you're not gonna get better. So the four legs of the table are diet, sleep, 
physical activity, and stress reduction. So for diet, you need to buy the healthiest food you can, the most nutrient-rich food. If you need to buy prepared foods, buy the rotisserie chicken or the bagged salad if that's gonna make you eat the healthy food. But eat a high-quality diet. Try to buy organic food as much as you can, um, especially higher up on the food chain, so meat, eggs, dairy. Um, and there's a great website that is on your, uh, on your handout, the Environmental Working Group, where you can go and get information about which are the uh, fruits and vegetables that are the most contaminated that you should absolutely buy uh, organic if you can, and then the things that you can kind of slide on that. So sleep. Your body is not a computer. It's not in a state of suspended animation when you're sleeping. It's a very dynamic and important phase of healing when you're sleeping. And your immune system depends on sleep in order to get better. So if your body says, I need 12 hours of sleep, you need to invest 12 hours of sleep. OK, um, physical activity. For many of my patients, I tell them that they need to do more physical activity. And for Lyme patients, I often tell them that they need to do less. Um, your body has a finite amount of energy. Any of you heard of the spoon theory? Raise your hand, spoon theory, a few of you. So the spoon theory comes from somebody who was um, having coffee with a friend of hers, a woman with lupus. And she was trying to explain to this friend how she really couldn't do everything that she wanted to do. And she grabbed a cup on the table that had a bunch of spoons in it, and she said, my energy is kind of like this cup of spoons. And some mornings I wake up, and there are six spoons in the cup, and sometimes there's two spoons in the cup, and sometimes there's 12. So take a shower, that's one spoon. I'm going to run out of spoons if I don't pay attention to how much energy I'm using. And so you really do need to pace yourself, and unfortunately, um, I think a lot of times people really can't work as many hours as they would like to. And, um, and so this, you know, obviously pushes up against the whole issue of, um, of saving money. Now, I know that a lot of you are the primary breadwinners of your family or you need to work in order to get insurance. Um, and that's a really tough thing. Uh, and that's something that your Lyme provider can help you work with of like how much can you um, conserve energy and, and still support yourself. The last thing is stress reduction. Um, the longer I do this work, the more amazed I am at the role of emotional healing in physical healing. And when somebody is stressed, um, they're, you're much less likely to get better. And, you know, of course you're stressed. You're sick and you're told that this is all in your head. But if you can deal with that stress through things like psychology, therapy, meditation, prayer, whatever you can do to have more peace in, your, in yourself, I think you're much more likely to, uh, to get better and to get better faster. Okay, so the first thing was you need to invest in your health. The second is you have to evaluate each option carefully for its value. You really need to look at every dollar that, that you spend. And I often see Lyme patients kind of grasping at every single supplement or every single device that they hear about. And I get it because people are so anxious to get better. And it's actually one of the things that I really admire and really love about Lyme patients is that that many of, you, many of you are constantly researching and constantly looking for things to, to improve your health. Um, but the problem is if all you do is grab onto the next thing, then you're not really assessing the benefit of that and the benefit cost ratio of that, um, and you're using things kind of willy-nilly. Um, so we all need to invest in our health, but I think you really need to be careful about what you spend your money on. So let me give you an analogy about that. These are the boots that I'm wearing. So I bought them about 10 years ago or a little bit more, and they're still in sort of pretty good shape. Um, and I spent you know, a moderate amount of money on them, but I could have bought boots that were a lot cheaper, made with shoddy ingredients. I probably would have thrown them away after a year or two. So I invested in the more expensive boots in order to get um, a longer wear. So 
I could have gotten the cheaper boots. I also could have bought, well, this is not exactly my style for those of you who know me, and I don't think I could have afforded those anyway. But the point is, you do want to get good quality, but you can spend more than you really need to if you're not careful. So just because a therapy is expensive, it doesn't mean it's that much more effective. It's kind of like Goldilocks gets Lyme disease. You need to like spend enough money, but not too much, just the right amount. Okay, so if you're gonna evaluate each option carefully, how in the world do you do that? So I have four questions that I ask patients to ask themselves. Is what you're thinking about doing safe? Is it effective? Is it cost effective? And are you able or willing to do it? So let's explore each of these one by one. So, is it safe? If something is strong enough to make you better, it's strong enough to give you side effects or make you worse. And pharmaceuticals are probably the, the most likely to have side effects, but any kind of natural treatment can also give you side effects. And it's not necessarily that you are not willing to have any side effect, you have to look at the benefit risk ratio. So, second question, is it effective? That's the really hard one, because unfortunately in this climate, there is very, very little research that's being done on Lyme and tick-borne illnesses, and in particular on treatment strategies. So the first thing is to look at how objective the evidence is. Where does the evidence come from? Is the evidence coming from a company that is selling this product and obviously wants you to buy it so that they'll make money? Is it data or is it testimonials? It's one thing to say, I used this product or this device or I did this program and I got better and that's great, but that really shouldn't be the, begin the end of your research. That should be the jumping off point. And you don't wanna just rely on word of mouth I would certainly listen to someone who says, I did this and it really helped me, but I think you can't just assume that just because it helped them that it's gonna help you. So I actually have a little equation that I tell people to use. So I ask, how cost effective is this? So cost effectiveness is how effective it is divided by how much it costs. So if it's possibly effective, and it's not too expensive, give it a go. If it's possibly effective and it's very expensive, you might not wanna jump on that bandwagon right away. If you can try out a device before buying it, if you can um, get more than just somebody, single individual's word of mouth about how effective this is, that would be helpful. Then the fourth question is, am I able or willing to do it? And that question is about not anything, so the other three things are things that you could pretty much say for anybody, they're gonna have the same response. The fourth question, are you able or willing to do it, is gonna be very individual based on what your particular phobias are, your particular um, abilities are. So for example, if an herb has a really bad taste and you find yourself not taking it, that's probably not a treatment that's gonna be helpful for you. Or if you have really bad brain fog, a regimen that involves multiple doses over the course of the day that some fasting and some with food and you, you ramp up the drops or you decrease the drops, that may not be something that you're gonna be able to do effectively. So you have to be honest with yourself about that. So, then, how do you answer those questions? So they're good questions, but you guys are not medical professionals. Well, most of you are not medical professionals, some of you are. And so what resources do you have to answer these questions? So the answer actually is in guideline number three, which is use your Lyme literate provider as a resource. That's what we are here for. My partner, Asani Stoddard, pointed out that Many Lyme patients have been so used to relying on their own uh, abilities because nobody's listened to them, because all of the healthcare providers that, that they've seen have said, 
um, there's nothing wrong with you, or I don't know anything about that, or I don't believe in Lyme. And so you really are kind of back to your own resources. So those of you who are working with a Lyme literate provider, like we are healthcare professionals and we can help you figure things out. So if you find a therapy that you're interested in, it's worth running it by your Lyme literate professional. And we've heard of a lot of the things that you're coming across for the first time. And often we can say, that's a great idea. I should have thought of that. I'm so glad that you brought that up. Or you know, in my experience, patients that have used that really haven't had much benefit. So we really want you to use us as a resource and get more information uh, about things that you're thinking of doing. Okay, so that was three. Four, negotiate to get the most cost-effective cost care. What? This is Minnesota. We're Minnesota nice. We are conflict avoidant. We don't want to ruffle any feathers, you know, how, I mean, like, this is like so antithetical to the nature of many of you that like I almost thought about leaving it out, but I think it's a very central part of, of the message that I'm trying to give you. Um, I get it that there's a power differential between you and your Lyme provider, you know, they're the healthcare professional, but you are basically hiring them. They're your employee. So you should be able to feel comfortable, hopefully, in saying, um, I can't do this, or can we do something different? Okay. So for example, if your Lyme provider was about to give you a prescription for an antibiotic that you knew you were allergic to, would you just be Minnesota nice and like not say anything? Hopefully not. So. If your Lyme provider says, I think you should take this medication and it's not covered by your insurance and it's $400 a month, well, why can't you protect, you know, you'll protect your, your medical health, you need to protect your financial health as well. So basically, you need to be upfront with us about your financial limitations. So let me give you a couple examples. Um, Provider wants to order thousands of dollars of lab tests. How many of you have had a recommendation to order, like, if not thousands, then at least hundreds and hundreds of dollars of testing? So, you know, and there is, there's a role for testing, and some testing is critically important. But could you say, could, is there any lab test that is not essential to your interpreting what's going on with me? Or are there any lab tests that we might be able to kind of postpone until later so that I can pay for some of them now and some of them later? A medication is not covered by your insurance or has a very high copay. How many of you have had medications that were not covered, that were literally $400 a month? Cefuroxine, Malarone, so, okay. How many of you just sucked it up and bought them? Yeah, so, okay. So, the sad thing about it is that very often, if a patient comes to me and says, or, the, or the, the pharmacy calls and says, this is not on the patient's formulary, can you do a prior authorization? I can say, oh, well, let's use this thing instead. And that is an, an, in their formulary and is covered and is a $25 copay. Um, there are certainly some medications that kind of have no alternative, you know, but even then you can say, if there's not anything that's equivalent, then maybe we need to go down a different path. Provider wants to see you every month. So there are some really good reasons that we want to see patients regularly, and it doesn't have to do with trying to milk you for, for money. It has to do with the fact that we want to make sure that the therapies that we're recommending are number one, not hurting you, and number two, that you're actually making progress. Because if we wait three months and you're treading water, then you're basically getting all of the risks of whatever that treatment is with none of the benefits. So we really do need to see you on a regular basis. Do I have any evidence that seeing you every six months is more dangerous or less effective than every four, four or excuse me, every six weeks rather than four weeks? No, you know, if somebody lives far away or if they are um, limited in funds, I'm certainly willing to negotiate. 
And the other option is that some providers will do phone appointments or Skype appointments, which are a lot quicker because we're not doing the physical exam. You don't have to drive for hours to get to our offices. But sometimes you can find ways to kind of stretch out your care. It's kind of like beef stew of your care if you can't afford to give everybody a steak. So there are, of course, some cautions. So if you're well off and you can really afford stuff, you probably shouldn't, I mean, it is appropriate to not pay $400 a month for, for care, but I certainly wouldn't like ask for discounted care if you're driving a Lexus or you just came back from Disneyland. So um, you obviously want to ask respectfully and, and listen to what the response is and try to see if there's any room for negotiation. So that's the four guidelines. And as I said, they're all written in your handout. So if you forget them, there they are. So now we're going to move on to some specific ways to save money. Labs and other testing. So if you go to your conventional clinic, there is a good chance that your insurance will cover labs that are drawn there. Now, there certainly is a convenience factor if you just have labs drawn at your Lyme providers, but often those end up coming out of pocket. So if you really need to conserve your resources, ask your Lyme literate provider if it's okay for, you know, obviously not hygienics, but for blood count, vitamin D, that kind of thing, to see if you can just get a written order to take it back to your clinic. You do need to ask your insurance, will you cover labs that are ordered by an out-of-network provider if they're done in an in-network clinic? And the answer to that, nine times out of 10, is yes. You can also ask for the cheapest panel of specialized tests. So I just mentioned that um, you, know, you can get an hygienics test, for example, that is several thousand dollars, or you can actually do something as inexpensive as $250. And you're obviously going to get a lot more information with the more expensive test. But if really all you can afford is the cheaper test, that's better than nothing. You can also call around if you've been uh, recommended. And, and this is actually not just for Lyme. But you know, let's say that you have a, a knee injury and you need to get an MRI and your deductible is $5,000. Well, it's worth calling around to find out where you can get the cheapest MRI or SPECT scan or whatever. So Lyme treatment itself. Stay close to home. So I have had patients that have gone to the East Coast or the West Coast and seen a Lyme provider there that has a national or an international reputation. And sometimes their case is not all that complicated. They probably could have just stayed at home and done it here. And there are in Minnesota and Wisconsin a lot of Lyme providers that are, that are very high quality. I mentioned negotiating the frequency of visits and seeing if you could do phone consults or Skypes. Um, especially for those of you who live hours and hours away from your Lyme provider, that can be a really cost effective and you know, not to mention energy conserving way to get your care. And then assess whether you're making progress or not. Um, as I said, one of the reasons that I see my patients on a regular basis is because I really want to make sure that what I'm doing is benefiting you. So if after two or three months and repeat visits, your Lyme provider hasn't really, you know, like, like you're not making much progress, then I think it's very appropriate for you to say, what's the next step? What should I do? And even consider getting a second opinion. Okay, prescription drugs. So as I said, if a drug's not covered, ask for a different one. And often there are things that are relatively equivalent. If you do have to pay out of pocket, it's really worth calling around for the cheapest price. And I have read that Costco Pharmacy is actually probably across the board one of the cheaper ones. So you may be able to get something super cheap, like a $4 for a month prescription for a particular thing at a particular pharmacy, but across the board, Costco tends to be cheaper. You don't have to be a Costco member. When they ask you for your card as you walk in the store, you can just say, uh, I'm just going to the pharmacy. You know, and then you can walk around and eat all of the, you know, the samples and stuff and then go to the pharmacy. So, um, so. And then there are cost savings cards. There's GoodRx. I know CVS has its own kind of little frequent flyer thing. 
Um, but there are some ways that you can get uh, cheaper prescriptions wherever you go. And then there's always getting drugs from Canada. And sometimes that really has a significant cost savings, sometimes not, but it certainly is worth checking out. Okay, herbs and supplements. Once you know something works, you can buy it in a larger size. So if you're taking some kind of herbal tincture, rather than getting the one or two ounce bottle every two to four weeks, you can get an eight ounce bottle and then just fill up your little bottle with the dropper in it. Um, you can consider buying online. Now, I, I know that a lot of your providers sell supplements and I don't wanna step on anybody's toes, um, but that can be, it, it's possible that you can find things the same things for cheaper online. And if that's the thing that's gonna make the difference between affording it and not affording it, that is just something that your Lyme provider is gonna to have to just suck up. Um, you can use punch cards and coupons. So Mississippi Market, which is one of the co-ops in St. Paul, has a 10% off on Wellness Wednesdays, which is the fourth Wednesday of the, or second Wednesday of the month or something. Um, Tailor Made Nutrition has the fourth Monday of the month where they actually offer 20% off of all of the supplements in the store. It's a great resource. And then the other cool thing you can do is to buy dried herbs in bulk and encapsulate them. So for somebody who can't afford to see a Lyme provider, who can't afford a lot of the tinctures, um, this is actually a really cheap way to get your care. Have any of you done encapsulating your own stuff? Okay, so a couple people. Um, so it's, it's actually not super hard. You do need to buy a scale and you know they're gonna give you a funny look in the store because they think you're gonna use it to weigh cocaine or marijuana, but you're not. You're weighing your Chinese herbs, your cat's claw, your Japanese knotweed. Um, and actually encapsulating is, is not that hard. You weigh out the amount you want, you stuff it into this little capsule thingy, you stick on the top, and there you have your capsules. Um, so, Make sure that you do buy reputable brands. This is something that, um, that I think is, is absolutely critical. If you buy brands that aren't any good and they don't work, it's not surprising. And a lot of people, to my surprise, get their supplements at places like GNC, Walmart, Costco, and I get it because they're cheaper, but this goes back to the boots. Sometimes you really do need to invest more especially on things like probiotics that are living organisms, on more expensive things like coenzyme Q10. So you wanna be careful that you're getting a reputable brand, and if you ask your Lyme provider, is there any brand that you think is good that would be equally effective, um, sometimes they'll give you some suggestions, and um, and then if you go to a place that has people that are knowledgeable, like Mississippi Market, Tailor Made Nutrition, um, some of the Mastel's Health Food Store, um, they can give you really good advice about this is a good brand, but this one costs half as much and is equally effective. Then I just have some miscellaneous hints. So whenever possible, use health savings accounts to pay for your Lyme care. And unfortunately, you can't usually use health savings accounts to pay for supplements, but often it will cover things like massage, chiropractic, acupuncture. You can try submitting bills to your insurance. Um, I've actually been surprised that some of my patients have gotten, you know, obviously not the whole amount back, but like a, you know, a sizable chunk, like enough to buy probiotics for a couple months. And I'm happy with that. And if you can't work, consider applying for disability. So I know that this is a difficult thing. I think you know a lot of people have that work ethic that makes it really hard to say, I can't give up. I think also emotionally, it feels like Lyme is winning if you say, I can't work. But if you really can't work and you're not getting better, then you may as well really try to, to use the system that you've been paying into all this time. Um, so if you have short-term or long-term disability through your workplace, um, that often is helpful. 
Um, Social Security disability is another thing that you may need to consider. And it's really too bad that we live in a country that has a system that's so broken that takes so long for people to qualify. Um, but it really is something to think about. If you do decide to try to get disability, it's absolutely critical for you to partner with an attorney that is not just some random attorney off the street, but somebody who really gets it about disability, knows the system, knows how to document what is wrong with you. And if you do end up um, trying to apply for disability, you really need to partner with your Lyme literate provider because there are things that we can put in the chart that are gonna be evidence that you are not okay, that you can't function. For example, every time one of my patients does the air hunger thing, I put that in the chart. Every time a patient interrupts me in the middle of a sentence because they're gonna forget what they say, what they're thinking if they don't interrupt me, I put that in the chart because it's absolutely critical to have those subtle things documented that you're not fine, that you really do have disability. So I am going to go to what is going to be my favorite part, which is hearing back from you. And if you disagree with something that I say, bring it on. That's OK. I'm not from Minnesota. I'm happy with conflict. So does anybody have cards that they want to pass around? And if anybody needs another card or another pen? So. Good question. So this is not necessarily actually a, a Lyme money question, but it's how do you convince somebody that they need to be tested for Lyme disease? Uh, and that's a, that's a really hard one because something that's glaringly obvious to you, you've lived through it. And if someone is either in denial or their doctor who they trust has told them that it's absolutely not Lyme, it's really hard. So I think probably the best you can do is, thank you, to wait until they get sicker, bring it up again in a non-confrontational -conf way, and just hope that at some point they're willing to listen to you. So, okay. Medications from Canada versus Mexico. Um, good question. So if we lived in Texas, I might have said get your medications from, from Mexico because you could drive across the border, stock up, and... Uh, come back and you'd be great. And because we're closer to Canada, I kind of, I think of Canada. Um, I know that, um, you know, theoretically the quality of medications in both places should be equivalent. And to be honest, I don't know enough about them. I know that wherever you get them, it really ought to be a, a reputable uh, website if you get them through a website. And then the question is, what does coenzyme Q10 do for me? So coenzyme Q10 is helpful for, uh, for increasing energy. If anybody is on a statin to lower their blood pressure, I mean their, their, blood, their cholesterol, they absolutely should be on, a, on coenzyme Q10 um, because it, re, it reduces the risk of the muscle aches and spasms that you can have with, um, with that. Okay. Um, do I work with children with Lyme? Yes, I will work with children as young as probably six or seven. Uh, Newbridge Clinic does a tremendous amount of work with younger children, and that's who I would recommend for, for littler kids. Um, do muscle testing. Um, muscle testing is one of those controversial things. Does anybody not know what muscle testing is? Should I explain? Yeah, okay. So, Dorian, come over here. So, put out your arm. And say, my name is Dorian. My name is Dorian. Okay, so I'm trying to push down her arm. It's not going. Okay, say, my name is Ben Franklin. My name is Ben Franklin. <laughs> oh, you did that on purpose. No, no. no I did. <laughs> really? No. Okay. So, so muscle testing is is a, an alternative therapy that uses your own body's kind of inherent subconscious wisdom, and it's it's fairly controversial. I mean, there's no hard data. There's no evidence-based medicine to say that it works or not. Um, I think that there are people that are very skilled in using it. There are people who are not very skilled in using it. And so um, you can certainly play around with it and try it yourself. And if, you, um, if you're trying to figure out, like, you know, should I use this supplement or this supplement, 
you know, and just kind of feeling them and kind of seeing what your body's telling you. So that's, that's the idea behind muscle testing. I do not personally do muscle testing because I, I'm not qualified. I don't feel confident in my ability to do it. Um, but I have had enough experiences of patients using it in ways that has been very effective. On the other hand, I've also seen it not work. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. Um, and uh, immunotherapy as a treatment for Lyme. There's a fascinating new um, treatment called low-dose immunotherapy. And it's actually a little bit like the old-fashioned allergy shots that people got probably as kids here a lot. Um, it's not shots though, it's a sublingual, so it's a liquid that you just put underneath your tongue. And Newbridge Clinic actually is using that very effectively from what I understand. So, but I, I don't do it myself. Uh, okay, what if you don't have insurance? Um, so whether you don't have any insurance at all, whether your deductible is super high, whether you have a kind of insurance like TRICARE or Medicare that really limits what's covered. Um, I think we're all kind of in the same boat in those situations. Um, if somebody has Lyme disease, um, probably the cheapest way to treat it, as I said, is actually to use herbal therapies. Uh, there's a man named Stephen Buhner, B-U-H-N-E-R, that has an amazing website that gives a tremendous amount of information about how to use herbal therapies. Gives a lot of information about brands and doses and stuff like that. But if you can't afford to see someone who treats Lyme, um, it, it, that's what I would do. So, okay, prescriptions. Ooh, executive membership at Sam's Club is the best price we've found for prescriptions. Well, there you go. So, glad to know that. Um, is there a list of Lyme treatment providers? Yes, you, um, you, it is not listed on our website, but if you're ever looking for people, we do have a listing, so you just send us a note via the website and someone will contact you with um, information on yeah. the doctors. So. Um, um, if you're looking for oh. a Lyme literate um, doctor here in Minnesota, you should contact MLA through our website. We don't post those because it, just for for to, to protect our doctors mostly. Yeah. yeah. So, but if you let us know that you're looking for a Lyme literate doctor, then we will contact you with a list of names. Yeah. And I'll just say that into the microphone that it's not on the Minnesota Lyme Association website, but if you call them, they can give you information. Um, what do you do when an infectious disease doctor refuses to accept a positive Western blot from hygienics? Um, you roll your eyes if you're me because you've seen it so many times. Um, you know, I, it, it's hard, but the thing is that even if they, if they accepted it, they would give you 28 days of antibiotics at most and then say that you're either cured or you have post-treatment Lyme syndrome. So um, I, I don't waste a lot of money trying to push back against infectious disease doctors. Um, I think that sooner or later it's going to be clear that we're right and they're wrong and that they painted themselves into a corner. and. Um, it's just really sad that so many people are suffering in the meantime. So, yeah. uh, so are there any newer treatments and new or better testing? Um, so testing is always problematic because what we're doing is most tests are looking at your antibodies. So it's kind of like looking at the shadow cast by the organism rather than the organism itself. And the problem with Lyme disease, as many of you know, is that this is a really intelligent, crafty bug, and it knows how to evade our immune system. And on top of that, many patients go to their doctor with a swollen knee and get steroids. Steroids suppresses your immune reaction. If you had a Lyme, uh, a tick bite, and you got a single dose of doxycycline that was supposed to prevent your getting sick, that also suppresses your immune reaction. So, so the vast majority of the tests are actually looking at immune, our immune function, which actually may improve with treatment and go from negative to positive, but in the meantime, it can start out negative. There was a blood culture which was taken off the market recently. I'm not sure what the problems were with that. Um, and Igenix has come out with a different 
set of, uh, of tests that they say are more accurate and unfortunately much more expensive. Um, there is a lab from Germany called Armin Labs that we've been experimenting with, um, but I don't know if other Lyme providers in, in town are. So, um, and then are there any newer treatments? We're always kind of coming up with ideas and there are certainly ideas of, of different antibiotics to use, um, Dapsone, Rifabutin, um, but it's not like there's been any huge breakthroughs. And unfortunately, until we get more research, to even look on the, like, the test tube level of what is happening, then you're, you know, it's, it's all just kind of like trial and error. So it's, it's very frustrating. Okay. Uh, do you know anyone who's gone to Germany and done the hyperthermia treatment? No. So let's apply the principles that I talked about before. So does anybody remember what the first one is? Is it safe? Okay. Is hyperthermia therapy safe? Um, I don't know a lot about the particulars of it. I, I don't know how high they get the core body temperature, but that's one of the things that I would like to know. Um, I know it is used in cancer patients, as, as the writer said, um, but I don't know about that. Is it effective? Um, you know, the problem is that we don't have a lot of data, and then is it cost effective flying to Germany, doing the treatment, which is probably not cheap, and not knowing for sure if it is very effective, you know, you might want to try things that are more likely to help for sure and are cheaper. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, so hyperthermia means high temperature. So you know how when you're a little kid and you get strep throat or, or influenza and your temperature goes up to like 105? Do you ever think why the body is wasting all that energy on heating you up? So it's because bugs don't like to be hot. And so the idea behind hyperthermia is that if you heat the body up enough, it's going to kill the bugs. And this is actually a therapy that was used for syphilis in the days before we had penicillin. So it, I mean, it kind of makes sense. Huh, yeah. Yeah, so infrared saunas is a little bit different. That's, that's detoxification. It's not making you so hot that it kills the bugs, I think. Does anybody else know more about hyperthermia? Ooh. Yeah, so you bring up to the temperature of 106 point something. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know of anybody who does it. Really? I mean, certainly among the, you know, the, the local Lyme providers that I know of, so. Yeah, so maybe you guys can talk about it after, after we're done. So, yeah, no, not a problem. Yeah, yeah, but again, it, is that 70% improvement? Yeah, so, but whose, whose statistics are that, you know, and who's benefiting from that? So yeah, it's, it's hard to know. Um, and then the other question is, which is safer, pick line or port? Um, pick line is an intravenous access that goes into the arm and it stays there. Port is actually something that's implanted underneath your skin. Um, both of them have risks. Um, both of them have, um, I, you know, I don't know what the statistics are about one or the other. So I guess I, I can't answer that question. I think as soon as you go from oral antibiotics to IV antibiotics, you're really upping the ante in terms of, of risk. Now, IV antibiotics can be the thing that makes the difference in getting you better, so I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but again, it's that benefit-risk ratio of, of why, why am I doing this and, and what's the benefit. Okay. What do you qualify as not improving? Huh, good question. Um, so sometimes people 
when they come back in, they'll say, I think I'm a little better. And I have a symptom checklist and I make them fill it out. And I say, what can you do now that you couldn't do a month or two ago? Because I don't want us to be lulled into thinking that we're making progress. So it shouldn't be something subtle. I mean, from month to month, you might not see a huge difference. And it's like the stock market. You're going to get better, worse, better, worse, better, worse. But you want the trend to be to better. And so one of the things that I think is important is making a list for yourself of like your three worst symptoms and kind of just like following that and maybe on a day by day or week by week um, kind of way of, of checking those because you do really want to prove to yourself that you're, that you're getting better. Now, you're not gonna go from really sick to not sick at all in a month or two or three or six maybe even, but you should be really able to say, in July, I couldn't have done this and now I'm doing it. Or in September, I felt this way and now I don't, so. Um, okay. Uh, cost effectiveness and value of hyperbaric oxygen. So how many of you have heard of hyperbaric oxygen? Okay, so the idea with hyperbaric oxygen is that oxygen is toxic to these bacteria and if you can get oxygen deeper into your tissues, you're gonna kill the bugs. So breathing oxygen isn't enough because there's only so much oxygen that goes in your bloodstream, like you can't get higher than 100% oxygen saturation. So hyperbaric oxygen is getting into a, what's a chamber that has increased pressure. So it's kind of like you're deep sea diving. They actually call them dives. And you get increased pressure with breathing oxygen and that gets the oxygen to deeply penetrate your tissues. I think that it is effective. Um, and this actually brings up a really important point is there's so much variability from individual patient to individual patient. Depends on what your, your previous health was like, what your genetics are like, how many co-infections you have, you know, how many unresolved traumas you have. So it's hard to tell who's gonna benefit the most from each individual treatment. And that's where that whole cost-benefit uh, reaction comes in, that if something's expensive and you might benefit and you can afford it, it might be worth trying. So I would say that if hyperbaric oxygen were covered by insurance, it is definitely something that I would use more frequently with patients. As it is because it's expensive, I, I will occasionally suggest that somebody do it but um, unfortunately, there's just not as much information about, about it. Um, oh, I should actually mention a great resource in terms of trying to figure out like what works and what doesn't work. How many of you have heard of my Lyme data? Few, have any, has anybody signed up for my Lyme data? Oh, we have to get some, some brochures for people. My Lyme data is a wonderful resource so if the government is not going to gather data, then we're going to do it ourselves. And MyLyme data is one of the largest patient-driven databases in the world. There are probably close to 10,000 patients have signed on. And it's just MyLyme data. If you just Google that, you'll get to their website. Patients are encouraged to sign in and tell their story. And as part of it, there is actually data being collected not just about like where you got bitten and how many doctors you saw before you finally got diagnosed and all that depressing stuff, but there's actually a bunch of information on what kind of treatments people have tried and how effective they are and how often they give side effects. So there are, there's data on things like acupuncture and um, antibiotics, herbal therapies, and some of the more esoteric things, and I think hyperbaric oxygen is in that, but it really is worth doing it to be part of this whole movement, but then also getting access to all that data. So I would really encourage you guys to do that. Okay, Wellness Pro. I know that some of my colleagues really believe in the Wellness Pro, which is, um, it's kind of like an electrical device it's sort of like a Rife machine, but sort of not like a Rife machine. And the idea is that you program a certain frequency into it 
and, um, and use it to kill the bugs. Um, so I have never used it myself. I mean, I've never used it on my patients. And so I don't really have a lot of data. I know that Dr. Karen Vercota really likes it and uses it a lot with her patients, so. Okay, uh, relationship between autoimmune disease and Lyme, any new information or studies on the horizon? Um, our immune systems are incredibly complex and we're just like barely scratching the surface about what the whole interplay between infection and the reaction of our immune system um, and I don't know of anything on the horizon. I know that, that there's constantly evolving stuff. And the good thing about autoimmune stuff is that people are more likely to be able to kind of like nibble at the edges of Lyme under the heading of autoimmune, that it, you know, it's, it's easier to kind of say like, this autoimmune phenomenon can happen with infections such as Lyme disease and then it's like, not to, um, how late should we go? We can have the Oh, wow. Okay, good. Do you need to give me more questions? Okay. Um, field control therapy for treatment for Lyme. Um, I actually don't know anything. I mean, I know the name. I don't know anything about it, though. So, um, uh, Okay. Do you believe in and help facilitate a full cure, or do you mainly improve health, manage symptoms for chronic Lyme patients? Um, we think about infections as being like a cold. You get exposed. You get the infection. Your immune system jumps into the fray, eradicates the virus, you have circulating antibodies, so for the rest of your life, you're never gonna get that particular cold. So we think of all infections as being like that. And I think what's much more common than we think is something that's more similar to chicken pox. So you get chicken pox when you're a little kid. You obviously get over chicken pox, but you never eradicate the virus. Your immune system is strong enough to make it dormant, to put it at bay, but it can't completely eradicate that virus. And decades later, it can come back out as shingles. So what we think is that for many of these, these infections, it may be that the majority of people get infected and they're actually able to just make this infection dormant. So there are people that get bitten by ticks, get infected, never get treatment, and they're fine because their immune system is strong enough to keep that walled off. So my suspicion, and this is obviously purely conjecture, that we probably never eradicate Lyme. I think Lyme is just too smart a bug, but if I can make it dormant so that it doesn't bother you, so technically I'm not curing you, but I'm making you well again, or you're making yourselves well again. So, uh, okay. Uh, buying a less expensive sauna can save a lot versus paying for each sauna at a clinic or gym. So yes, and there it's the cost-benefit analysis, like how good a, you know, how good a sauna is it? Is it a, a shoddy sauna or is it a my boot kind of sauna? And so you kind of have to like do your due diligence and if you can use somebody else's sauna, you know, maybe a couple people could get together and like buy a sauna together even and take turns using it. Um, but that's a, that's a great idea because using an infrared sauna at like a chiropractor's office or a spa is how much? What, $30, $40 sometimes? Yeah, so it can be pretty expensive. So yeah, that adds up. That's a good idea. Um, uh, recommend lab tests after 18 months to two years of treatment um, to measure remaining amount of bacteria help to determine progress. So. It's bad enough that we have terrible tests to diagnose this. We have like no tests that are useful for monitoring progress. Um, it used to be that we thought that the CD57 test, which is a blood test, which measures a subset of your, um, your white blood cells was helpful. And then that's kind of fallen out of favor. Testing your immune function, your IgM, your IgG levels may or may not be helpful. I really think it's better to just like look at how your body's doing. Because if you're feeling well, then I, that's, a, that's a better predictor of how you're gonna do when you finish treatment than any kind of lab test that I know of. And hopefully at some point during my career, or at least my lifetime, we're gonna have tests that will diagnose Lyme well and be able to monitor treatment. But unfortunately, we don't have it now. Um, 
can a Lyme patient ever be certain that Lyme contagion is over? They are well, totally free of Lyme. Lyme uh, uh, that you have to, uh, or is Lyme like, oh, herpes? Uh, so anyway, so I think what you're asking is, kind of going back to what I was saying was, do you ever eradicate it or is it possible that you could theoretically um, harbor it and pass it on. So I think that if you are feeling well, the likelihood that those little buggers are still actually actively circul circulating in your body are less, um, but we don't know. It's one of the many things, and, and I often have patients asking me about sexual transmission and transmission to babies, and that's one of the areas we absolutely need more research in. Okay, detox foot bath. Um, I've had patients that have used them and say that they're successful. I don't really know that much. Um, Rife machines, again, it's, um, I, I've had patients that have used them that say that they really help. Um, but if you look at the MyLyme data, not as many people as I would like to see say that they got benefit, that there are more that say that it didn't help or they're not sure. Um, so what I would say is if you wanna try the Rife machine, borrow it from somebody, rent it from somebody, see if it feels like you're actually making, not just herxing or maybe feeling better right after that, but if you're using it consistently for a while, are you actually making progress? So, and that's, that's one of the things with a lot of these treatments is if you herx, you might think, oh my God, I'm getting better. But if you herx and then you go back to your baseline and you herx and you go back to your baseline, you're really not getting any better. Okay. Manual lymph drainage provider. I know that Bartonella in particular is one of the infections that will really gum up your, your lymphatic system. Um, and I know that manual lymph drainage can be helpful. Other things like um, osteopathic manipulative techniques, cranial sacral therapy, myofascial release um, might also be helpful. I don't know if they're specifically doing exactly the same thing. But I think a lot of, um, a lot of body work can be very helpful. Oh, Bartonella, yeah, B-A-R-T-E-N-O, B-A-R-T-O-N-E-L-L-A. -L -L okay, how much money is typically necessary to get a Lyme diagnosis that is 80% certain, 90% certain, 100% certain? Okay, good question. So the 100% certain, I would say infinity because those tests don't exist. Um, 80 or 90, you know, I tell patients that Lyme is primarily a clinical diagnosis. And if every single Lyme test in the universe is negative, but your story is like so classic for Lyme disease, I'm gonna go ahead and treat you as long as you understand that what I'm doing is not the standard of care, that we're doing a therapeutic trial to see if you respond. So um, there is unfortunately no test that I think is 80 or 90%. Dr. Odlin, what do you think? Is there, no, okay, yeah. Um, because, um, again, it also depends on how suppressed your own immune system is. So, and then how certain does someone need to be before starting Lyme therapy? Okay, so that, that's kind of part of that question. Um, you know, if I think somebody has Lyme, I'm willing, even with negative tests or in certain extenuating circumstances, if you absolutely can't afford any testing at all beyond the conventional testing, if your story is absolutely classic for Lyme disease and you understand that we're basically doing something that we're not really sure is gonna work, I will treat you. That's me personally. And different healthcare providers will have different opinions on that. So, last batch. Uh, okay. Oh, outrageous tan in Wyoming, Minnesota. Infrared sauna, $10 for 30 minutes and packages of 12 30-minute sessions for under $60. So there you go. So you don't have to buy one yourself. You can go to Wyoming. So. Yeah, so, yeah that's, that's a great idea. Okay. Um, heard before you treat Lyme and co-infections, you should treat parasites first. Thoughts? What's your opinion about how big parasite treatment? Any key things in treatment of parasites? Um, so... There are kind of these trends in Lyme, just as there are trends in fashion and trends in everything else. And I think parasites are kind of like trendy right now. Um, I mean, they've been around for a while. We've, we've dealt with them. And I do think that parasites can impede 
um, impede improvement. Um, just because you're not having diarrhea and passing big worms doesn't mean you don't have parasites. But unfortunately, a lot of the tests that we have are not all that accurate. So if you go to your primary care provider and say, I want to be tested for parasites, if you don't have loose, mushy stools, the lab won't even take it. So even if you have loose, mushy stools, they kind of like look under the, micro the microscope, uh, no, nope, we don't see them. Um, there are companies like Genova or Doctors Data that will do a much more uh, careful analysis. That can be helpful. And if it's negative, even that doesn't mean that you don't have them. But, um, I, you know, I, I worry a little bit. I, I mean, I certainly, I personally do not treat parasites first. I see how far I get with Lyme treatment. If I'm not getting very far, then I'll step back and go, oh, could this person have heavy metals, parasites, something else. And then Gerson protocol, um, I have not used myself. Um, I, I don't really know much about using it for Lyme. I've heard of using it for things like cancer, but not Lyme. So, uh, can you speak more about why it is important for Lyme patients to eat organic? Absolutely. Um, so in the same way we just talked about parasites and I mentioned heavy metals, if you have a lot of plastics and pesticides and things in your body, it's gonna gum up your immune system and potentially make it harder for you to heal. So as much as you can eat organic, then I think that it's, gonna de it's not gonna continue increasing the burden of all the toxins in your body. So I don't have any double-blind placebo-controlled trials but I think it generally is important to do. Now, if you can either buy organic or buy probiotics, I think you should buy probiotics. But if you can buy organic as much as possible, I think that's an important thing to do. Um, Lyme and Hashimoto's struggling to lose weight. Um, and it's not just Hashimoto's, which is a thyroid dysfunction. It's not just people with, with overt thyroid dysfunction. Um, one of the things I think that your body does is when you're sick, it tries to kind of slow you down. It's going to kind of make your thyroid less functional because you want to really rest rather than be running around. Your body wants you to conserve energy. Um, the other thing is that the tick-borne illnesses actually affect your metabolic rate and your endocrine system. So um, I don't have a lot of great ideas. Um, I think the more that you can eat a healthy plant-based diet, which does not mean that not eating meat, but it's like if most of what you're eating is vegetables, you're filling up your stomach with a lot of fiber and that can be helpful. Um, but I, um, I don't really have a lot of help. Then the question is, do patients lose weight when they're in remission? And that I would actually say is often what happens. Some of it is that you can just move more so you're physically more active, but I think that there are all kinds of hormonal shifts that happen too. Okay, top three ways to detox. Oh, yes. Um, so, you know, a lot of it depends on what you're detoxing from. But the first thing is if you can reduce the amount of additional toxins you put in your body, um, you can use things like bentonite clay activated charcoal. You have to take them at a separate time than any of your antibiotics, your supplements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that can be helpful. Um, and then uh, infrared saunas are excellent, drinking plenty of water. Um, and then foods like cilantro, um, chlorella can be helpful as well. Um, Field control therapy, sorry, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. And how are transfer of limes happening? So you mean like sexual or vertical transmission to babies? Is that what that question was about? Okay, so um, it, it's very interesting. I had a patient come in the other day who was asking those questions and she and her partner have not been sexually active. Um, they understand that they need to use protection, i.e. condoms, if they're gonna be sexually active with intercourse. But she was asking about, like, what about kissing? Like, we don't know. And so I went onto the ILADS listserv and I said, hey guys, what about kissing? And I got back a couple of really interesting studies about Babesia being transmitted um, either through drinking water in mice or mice either eating dead mice that were infected 
or getting the blood from dead mice that were, that were infected in their mouth for Babesia, so nothing about Lyme. Now, our own beloved Dr. Maloney wrote back and she said that um, ticks have particular things in their saliva, so they've kind of co-evolved with Lyme, and the ticks have elements in their saliva that actually protect the Lyme bacteria from our immune system. So her theory is that if you're getting it through your bloodstream through a tick bite, then the Lyme is gonna escape detection. But if you're passing it through saliva, that you're not necessarily going to get, that, 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 that the bacteria doesn't have the same protection and it would be less likely to get, get passed on. Having said that, we know that, that live spirochetes, live Lyme, live in vaginal secretions and semen. We know that there have been case reports of it passing between a sexually active couple. So I do think you have to be careful. It absolutely can pass from mother to baby, and I strongly recommend that anybody who is thinking about getting pregnant and is, is sick, wait a significant amount of time after they're finished with their therapy or that you stay on antibiotics for the full um, time of the pregnancy and for breastfeeding as well. So, but actually one of this, I'm on the ILADS planning committee for next meeting, which by the way is gonna be in Chicago, which is a lot closer than the East Coast at least. And that is probably one of the things that we're gonna have on the program is trying to, to figure out the sexual transmission and the, the vertical transmission. So have at least as much information as we have. So any other questions? Yep. Oh, bee venom therapy, yeah. So that's another thing that's um, kind of a, a little bit interesting and exotic. Um, I have had patients that have done it. Um, it's expensive, it's potentially dangerous. Um, you have to have an EpiPen with you at all times in case you do react to um, the, the bee stings. Um, you know, for the cost, I, I'm, I'm not super impressed. But again, I, I don't have a lot of experience with it, just a few patients that have tried it. Yeah. 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 And actually, it, it's interesting. There's a, a guy um, at the university named ha Hank Balfour that's working on Epstein Barr. And he and I have collaborated a little bit about trying to create um, a combination of an antiviral prescription and an herbal antiviral program because patients will get resistant to the prescription antiviral. And so we're seeing whether combining the the herbals, which are much more sophisticated and complex chemically, will will help with that. So, uh, let's see. The, uh, Hi, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about CBD oil, and if you if you do like that uh, place to get it. Yeah. So CBD oil stands for cannabidiol oil. It is uh, from the hemp plant. So there's marijuana, and there's hemp. So marijuana has CBD oil and THC oil. Hemp has less than 0.3% THC, and so it's mainly CBD. Um, it can be extremely effective for pain, anxiety, um, and you know now that Minnesota has medical marijuana that is allowed for things like pain, that's also something um, that I suggest to patients if they can afford it because it is a very expensive program. But I think that CBD oil is worth a try. Um, and there are a lot of good places to get it. Um, again, the places that I like are the co-ops that are gonna have good quality control, Mastel's, TaylorMade Nutrition. Um, I think actually Whole Foods and places like, I don't know about some of the bigger chains like Hy-Vee and Fresh and Natural, so, but yeah. Uh, let's see, maybe, maybe we should do the cards again. I'm just afraid, I don't wanna take people out of order, but maybe I'll take one question while your, while people are writing down there. So and you're, you're close so I can hear you better. My question, I'm the one that asked about the 80, 90, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Because it seems like people wind up getting treated for Lyme when they've been treated for lots of other things and they didn't get better. Yeah. So it seems like there's this break point at which you spend some money to figure out, well, yeah, it could really be Lyme, so maybe I should just treat it. Uh-huh. Unless, unless there's a long course of prescriptions, it seems like the herbs and the, or 
organic eating and uh, Sauna, yeah. Thing to do prior to spending $2, $3, yeah. Tests you try this yeah. So correct me if I'm wrong. You're kind of saying, is isn't it worth just you know rather than spending tons and tons of money on testing, what if you just empirically treated yourself with herbs and infrared sauna and things that you know again would be you know safe, possibly effective and cost effective. So yeah. Um, so I think that that's a good point. So I, I will say in terms of, of a lot of the, because when you say testing and you say, you know, people have seen a lot of doctors and stuff, I do think that it's, it's important to rule out things like colon cancer or, you know, if somebody has rheumatoid arthritis or lymphoma. I mean, I want to know that there's not something else causing your symptoms. So working through the conventional system to some extent knowing that they're going to say, you know, your Lyme test is negative, and then saying That's yourself, really what I'm saying. yeah, you're what saying, I'm saying is once you've gone through all that, yeah, 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 so once that you've gone through all you, that, yeah, now you're at this, well, yeah. Could it be Lyme? yeah, how much do I spend on testing before I get treated? Yeah, how, how much do you spend on testing before you just empirically treat yourself? So, you know, or part of it, yeah, so part of it, I think, depends on how, um, how anxious you are to get better. So, it, I think it's reasonable to say, I'm going to give myself three months of doing all of the natural treatments I can think of that might be helpful and see how much traction I get. And if I haven't gotten anywhere with that, then maybe it's worth seeing a Lyme literate provider and getting some of the testing. Does so that kind of answer? Okay. Okay. Controversy in regard to the positive 41 band. So I tell patients that the Western blot, which is the second half of the conventional test, and it's what Igenix has been using, is kind of like a police artist sketch. You know, so you're, you're trying to paint a picture of what the bug is through your antibodies. So, so there's like, you know, he had blonde hair, his ears stuck out, he's wearing red sneakers. And so there are certain um, characteristics that really don't narrow it down much. So if you say he had blonde hair, in Minnesota, that's like the 41 kilodalton band, in my opinion. That there's a lot of cross-reactivity between the 41 kilodalton band um, with Lyme and other things. So if the only thing that's positive is the 41 band, I'm not super impressed. So, um, at what point do you have a patient go off antibiotics to see if they're done with treatment? Good question, because we can just kind of go on forever and ever. Um, and I will usually try to get people to the point where they say, I'm about 90, 95% back to normal. And I will then overlap with herbs for at least a couple months. In fact, I usually use herbs as part of my treatment strategy, you know, ongoing. But I will then stop antibiotics at some point and then keep patients on herbs for at least a while and then have them taper off of the herbs. Um, and then if they relapse, we're like, oh, okay, I guess they had a biofilm we didn't get at, or you know, there was some other hidden reservoir, and you know, let's go back to the drawing board. Um, lymphatic drainage practitioner, again, sorry, don't know. Thoughts on biofeedback machines. Um, I, I don't know a lot about them. Um, if you're talking about, are you talking about biofeedback for like mind-body medicine, or is it something more related to Lyme treatment person? Oh, like electrodermal screening kind of? What's going on is healthy tremendously. So I mean, there's, it's only been since September, but I've seen the difference and they just start eating. Yeah, yeah. I guess I, I don't have any experience with it, so sorry. Um, role of probiotics when being treated for Lyme. Okay, so if you are on antibiotics, we are basically dropping atom bombs of antibiotics onto your poor little gut bacteria. And it is absolutely essential to be using probiotics to replace the bacteria that we're killing because you are at risk of an infection called C. difficile colitis. How many of you guys know about C. difficile colitis? Yeah, so not, not that many. You, you absolutely do not want to get it. It is a really bad, mean, nasty bacteria that causes a severe gastroenteritis with really 
bad diarrhea. And the problem is it's a really hard bug to eradicate. So once you've had C. difficile colitis, putting somebody back on antibiotics is really medical legally not necessarily a wise thing to do. Um, so the best way to prevent you from getting those kind of problems is to be very aggressive with probiotics. And I like to use both a combination of a mixed strain probiotic and something called Saccharomyces boulardii. So it's like in the Wizard of Oz when they say, are you a good witch or are you a bad witch? You know, we think of witches as being bad, but in the Wizard of Oz, not only are there good witches, the good witches fight the bad witches. So that's exactly what's going on in your stomach with yeast. We think of yeast as being bad, but in actuality, there are good yeasts and they will fight the bad yeast and keep it from overgrowing while you're on antibiotics. So if you can only afford one kind of supplement, make it probiotics, make it high quality. If you have diarrhea anyway, you need to up the dose. Okay, what about treatment for neurological Lyme? So, you know, I think the treatment for neurological Lyme is the treatment for Lyme. And maybe we'll stop after this. Is that, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I could go on, and you, people can ask me questions. I just, you know, you guys are probably getting tired of sitting for a while, so. Um, I do actually like a lot of herbal therapies that are helpful to, um, to treat kind of the symptoms of neurological Lyme. So there, there are a number of, um, of herbs that are effective specifically against things like Lyme rage, twitching, um, brain inflammation. So uh, if you go to Stephen Buhner's website, I, that's kind of what I would do if you're looking for treatment specifically for symptoms of neurological Lyme. And then otherwise, I think you just need to treat the Lyme. Okay, stevia drops. Ah, okay. Um, so one of the things that I didn't really emphasize, uh, I think I put it in the notes, but I didn't say, is there's a big difference between research and research. So there is one study that involved dropping stevia on Lyme in a test tube, and it killed it. Well, that's great, but how much stevia do you have to have in your system to get at the Lyme bacteria that are not like in your bloodstream, they're like hiding in your tissues and your joints and stuff. So I know that there are providers in the area that are using stevia. Stevia is pretty safe, it's pretty cheap. If you wanna use it, I don't think it's a problem, but I really question whether the research that's been done on stevia so far really gives us any information about what's happening in, in human beings. So let me just talk a little bit about kind of levels of research. So there's the test tube. Like, that's great. I really don't care what happens in the test tube. I wanna see what's happening in a living organism. There's research on mice. That's great. I really wanna see what's going on in primates. There's research on monkeys. That's great. But I really wanna see what's going on in human beings. So we have to do what we do with the information we have, and often the best we have is test tube, and we can kind of extrapolate from that, but um, I hope as time goes on, we'll have more and more human research to help us with that. Okay, uh, Lyme versus MECFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, myalgic encephalomyelitis. Um, I got into this because I was treating fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, for years and years, and I actually did um, a sabbatical and learned more about it, and one of the people that I, uh, that I mentored with was Karen Vercota in Winona, and she said, you know, 60% of what we call chronic fatigue syndrome in Minnesota is Lyme disease, and I said, really? And I fell down the rabbit hole. Um, so I think it's not like you either have ME, CFS, fibromyalgia, or you have Lyme. Those are all just descriptions of a bunch of symptoms. And I don't think that everybody that has those conditions has Lyme disease, but I think that one of the ways that our bodies manifest um, this infection is to have fatigue, wandering pain, brain fog, stomach issues, head, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I would basically say, that if I'm coding to get something covered by insurance, I call it 
ME-CFS fibromyalgia. If I'm being honest with myself, I often call it Lyme disease. Uh, oh, you can use Sam's Club Pharmacy without a membership too. Awesome, that's good to know. Um, but I think if you have the executive Sam's Club membership, you probably have to be a Sam's Club member or so. Um, oh, and you don't, need, you don't need membership for the liquor either. Hey, who's drinking alcohol here? <laughs> no sugar, no alcohol. <laughs> uh, have you or your colleagues used the BICOM, which is a bioresonance machine for healing? Almost every country allows this except the US. I used it in Holland. I don't know anything about it, unfortunately, sorry. Um, what herbs have you found to be more effective across the larger population of Lyme patients? Best pain supplement. Okay, so in terms of herbs for Lyme, um, the cool thing about herbs is antibiotics are kind of like, you know, I said dropping an atom bomb on things. It's like the Incredible Hulk. The antibiotics go in there and they, they destroy everything. So hopefully they destroy the Lyme, but they destroy a lot of other stuff too. The herbs are kind of like the diplomats that go in and they boost the immune system and they calm down the inflammation and then they, you know, kind of poison the, the Lyme, you know. So, Herbs are really wonderful because they have so many multiple effects. And the ones that I think are the most effective for Lyme are Japanese knotweed, cat's claw, um, cordyceps, which is basically an immune booster. Um, I mean, I could go on and on about li uh, Lyme and herbs. I, it's just, it's so exciting to be looking at all the different herbs and kind of mixing and matching and stuff. Um, the other thing about herbs, just to point out, is that unlike an antibiotic where everybody takes 100 milligrams twice a day, the herbs really have different levels of effectiveness in different people. So somebody might take a quarter teaspoon twice a day and get great benefit, and somebody else might need a half a teaspoon three times a day. So you have to kind of listen to your body to see how much it wants. Um, and also, best pain supplement. So CBD oil, I think, can be excellent. Um, there's another one that we've been using a lot called PEA. It's pal palmitoyl ethanolamide, like P as in Paul, E as in elephant, A as in apple. Um, and it's, it's really extremely effective for a lot of people. But it's like with anything. I mean, buy a month's worth, try it, see if it helps. If it doesn't, then stop it. So... Uh, Treatment suggested like the Rife machine, can this be safe not being administered by a professional? Um, you know, I've had patients that have had severe herxes from Rife machines. I don't think any of them were life-threatening. Um, so I guess, you know, the little bit that I know about Rife machines, the idea is that you have somebody who's telling you what frequency to use. But again, I don't know enough about Rife machines to give any kind of a reasonable answer. Uh, Aetna Clinic in Scottsdale. Again, is it safe? Is it effective? Is it cost effective? Any place that is like a residential place and any place that's far away, I worry about a lot in terms of, um, of whether you're getting a bang, the bang for your buck. Uh, and I know that it sounds, it, it, it's a great idea. It's like I'm going to go someplace for a week and they're going to give me like IV vitamin C and, and I'm going to lie on the beach or whatever. But um, unless you really have plenty of money, I would say that something like that is probably not going to be the best use of your money. Um, infrared heat or temp, how long? Um, I don't know a lot. I don't have any particular um, strategies for how to use it. I will say that it's important to not do it for too long. So just try five or 10 minutes at not a super high temperature, see how your body responds to that. Because I've had patients that have gotten really sick and you know really just like been in bed for a day or two if they've done something like that for too long. Um, bentonite clay, um, liquid, how to take. I've generally used capsules or powder. Um, and again, you wanna take it on an empty stomach and it can cause constipation. And um, I think you kind of maybe start with a quarter teaspoon and work up to half a teaspoon twice a day. Um, do you like to use pulsing as treatment? So pulsing is one of those other things that is, you know, kind of like sexy right now, I think. 
And um, it, so the disadvantage of pulsing, which is take antibiotics for a while, stop, take antibiotics for a while, stop. I think the idea is that you stop taking them, the bacteria kind of poke their heads out above the surface of the ground, they put their heads out of the foxhole, and then you jump on them again with, with uh, antibiotics. Um, I tend not to do that as initial therapy. Um, the people that I respect the most that do it are gonna do it more as um, kind of, you know, we've tried everything, we've gotten most of the infection, every time we stop it comes back, then to stop the treatment, wait for the symptoms to start coming back, and then do it again. The problem with pulsing is that the more you're on and off with the antibiotics, the more likelihood of actually developing resistance you have. So it doesn't make sense to me to do pulsing. And I know Dr. Jemsek and there are other people who will do you know, a week of this and a week of that and a week of this, and um, it just doesn't make sense to me. So, so anything else? So thank you. This is Birch Tree Healing Arts, and thanks so much for your attention. Yeah.